podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Smart People Podcast. I'm Chris Dem. And I'm John Rojas. I want to know who out there has been bitten by the fitness bug. If you run a marathon, you put the little 26 point whatever on your bumper sticker. Or if you do the Tough mutter like John, you just brag about it all the time. Not all the time, man. I almost <laughs> just... died. I hated it. I'll never do it again. Do we, we have a video of that, don't we? Can we put that up on the post? I don't think we have a video of it. <sighs> so... If you don't know what the Tough Mudder is, it's pretty crazy. At one point, you have to run through electric wires. Yeah, it's an obstacle race. It's usually between like five and ten miles. It's awful. <laughs> and, John, oh, and John kept getting electrocuted, and he almost, I don't know, man. Yeah, really funny. I think I have like a heart defect now. Anyways, the reason I bring this up is because you find out when people run a 5K, they run want to run a 10K. And the marathon, it's crazy. Sometimes you want to go nuts with an Ironman. Today, we are interviewing the winner of the most recent quintuple Ironman. Hang on. What does quintuple mean? Quinn, coming from the Latin quintus, meaning five. Thank you. I just completely made that up. But <laughs> it means five. This is five Ironmans put into one, which ended up being four days long. It's, it's comprised of a 12-mile swim. 560 mile bike ride and you just you just round it out with 131 mile run no thank you today's guest is olaf dolner as i mentioned he won the quintuple ironman he's also just on the side a phd in molecular physiology currently a postdoc scientist at rockefeller university and he's researching the genetics of the hormone leptin and its role in obesity and metabolism originally from stockholm sweden Olaf is a baller. He is the man. I think he's an inspiration for everybody in terms of, oh, I don't have time to exercise. I can't do this. I can't do that. And this guy ran the equivalent of a times five Ironman. Like, I mean, when we first got what on the excuses phone, can we make? I was like, I don't know what to ask you. It's yeah. too much. So enough drooling over it. I just need you to wrap your brain around five Ironmans in one. But make sure you head on over to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Sign up for the newsletter. We have revived that. It's pretty much going to be hopefully a bi-weekly thing. It's pretty quick, but it's got good stuff, highlights and all that. Uh, so we'd like to be able to reach out to you. Leave a rating on iTunes if you can. You know how much we appreciate that. But other than that, please enjoy this week's episode with Olaf Dahlner. Well, Olaf, as I mentioned prior to hitting the record button, I found the headline that said you won the quintuple Ironman, and it was the first thing that sparked my interest in talking to you. So let's jump into that and talk about what the hell is a quintuple Ironman and what would possess somebody to do something so insane? (laughs) Well, a quintuple Ironman is basically uh, a distance of a triathlon. Now, an Ironman is, is is a brand, of course, but it's also a certain distance. You know, it's a, you know, you have to swim 2.4 miles, you have to bike 112 miles, and then you run a marathon, 26 miles. So a quintuple would be doing five times that distance. There's different kinds of of ultra triathlons like this. Quintuple Ironman could be doing one Ironman a day for five days. The one I did is continuous, which means you do all of the swim five times the length of a regular Ironman distance, and then you do all of the bike and you do all of the run. So essentially you start by swimming 12 miles, then you bike 560 miles, and then you run uh, 131 miles. I don't understand that. I mean, (laughs) I want to know what question to ask, but I can't wrap my brain around it. So here's where I'll start. I am a fairly athletic in shape guy. I don't run marathons or anything. If I said, I'm going to do this, no, no time frame. I mean, two, it could be five days. It could be 10 days. Well, we'll yeah. say 10 days. Can I do it? Is this something that the human body can do or does it take a lifetime of preparation? Absolutely, yes. I personally believe so because 
yes, it's going to require a lot of you planning, training, and so on. But I personally think that we're better adapted at doing things at a lower speed. Like, you know, I, I, if I run a marathon and I try to run for a PR, I really I feel like I'm destroying myself. I'm running really hard for quite a long distance, and it'll take a, quite a while for me to recover after that. I'd probably recover faster after something like this because you're going so much slower at a such lower intensity that I think uh, anyone can do it, really. It, it becomes a mental game, really, because, you know, it's a long time and you're your body's going to feel a lot of pain, but I, I truly believe anyone can do it. I was actually hoping you'd bring up the mental aspect because I want to talk more about that, especially because you, you just said it, right? Your body's going to feel a lot of pain. And my immediate question is, doesn't pain mean stop? And then doesn't that mean pushing through that? I mean, I just don't have that mentality. I know I've talked to runners and lifters and all that stuff. Oh, but you can do so much more. And my response is always, I mean, I might be able to, but there's no way that's natural or healthy. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, I really don't think that's true. I think, you know, I mean, I sort of feel, when I think about it, I feel like humans probably, we're probably able to move over fairly long distances, you know, throughout evolution. We had to, to be able to find, you know, sustenance, to find food or whatever. I mean, my personal opinion is that I think we're better adapted to do, to do that. Humans can probably move better over a long distance than a horse can. We're more adapted to do that. Wow. So I feel anyone can do it, really. I really do. Do you think humans have just become lazy because we do have everything, you know, all these luxuries of cars and other forms of transportations? And now people pat themselves on the back for getting 10,000 steps a day. We wear these fitness wearables to track our movement and that kind of thing. And we do 10,000 steps and we're like, yes, we, we've done it, which is close to six miles, I think. But I mean, do you think we've just become more and more lazy over time because of the technology advances that we've had in forms of transportation? Oh, definitely. I mean, if you go out, if you need to do something, and I live in New York City, so <laughs> I, I mean, I live in the middle of Manhattan, so I, I know this, you know, sometimes we need to go places, we need to be places, and it's not always that you have the time, then you end up, you know, taking subway or a cab or, you know, you're not going to move. Mm -hmm. I think we sort of forgot how to move, and I think we're really made to move much longer distances. It's fairly obvious that's the case. And uh, I believe that anyone that put their mind to it can can do these things. They seem, they seem... I mean, sometimes I can't even really comprehend the distance or what I'm doing. I believe it was my fifth or sixth triathlon ever. So I'm not really a triathlete by any means. I hadn't even done an Ironman distance before that. Before so winning, before winning I, the quintuple? No, I, only, I had only do, done two half Ironmans. Oh my now, gosh. But I had done a lot of ultra type events. I mean, all different kinds. Of okay. Events. So I have a lot of experience in how to push myself, and how to go for a very long time, but I'm not a good triathlete by any means. So what I'm trying to say is like, you know, you don't have to be a elite triathlete to do this. It's, it's more about experience and knowing yourself and how to push yourself and keep going. Well, so let's talk about that because I think those things are, are something that can benefit people in all walks of life, I'd imagine. And I was really interested to talk to you to see what mental process is going on during this. What, what have you learned? I mean, that's an intense experience. And I'd love to hear how do you quell the inner fears and the doubt and the pain? What tips, tricks you learn during this process? I, I'd say it's, it's, it's experience is it's very important because, you know, if you run a, let's say you run a 10K or a half marathon or a marathon. Most people experience their ups and downs just during that distance. Even if you run a marathon, a lot of people know like around eight, mile 18, 19, you don't feel very well. And once you push through that, you know, you're going to finish and do well. This is the same. You're just going to experience it 50 times. <laughs> so, but the thing is, when you, when you get to that low, you know, this is my brain playing with me. And I can do things to pull myself out of this. And you can... Uh, you can make sure you have some food. You can check yourself. There's just different ways, you know, of, of getting yourself out of that. And then five minutes later, it feels like you're on top of the world. So, yeah, that's interesting. The thought that you can kind of recoup mentally and you, you feel it actually changes your physical ability to perform. Oh, definitely. Wow. Most, most definitely. I, I feel 
I think most people that do any longer distance will, will experience this, that it can really go, you can feel like you are about to just quit right that minute. And if you do the right things, five minutes later, it feels like, you know, you, you can't even comprehend why you even thought about quitting. It's just you're, you're perfect. So <laughs> you said that that happens like mile 18 or so for a marathon. Is that typically around the point that people run into that where they break through this wall and then they feel on top of the world? Because I ran a Tough Mudder and it was, I think, like nine or 10 miles with all the obstacles and stuff. And I almost died. It was the worst thing I've ever done. Literally. Yeah, I... <laughs> I, I truly did almost die, but my body's never been in so much pain. And I never got to that point where I felt like, oh, I feel great. Like, this is the best. It was really at the end of the race. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to collapse and die now. <laughs> uh, a lot of people that do marathons experience that around eight, mile 18. I think. But that's, I think it's true. It's really true for any race. Because, I mean, if you know the distance of the race, you're going to go a certain speed. And so there's usually a, there's usually a given point when you feel... It also depends if you do something like a triathlon, you know, I mean, I personally am not a very strong swimmer. I had to put a lot of effort into becoming a swimmer, you know, and it's 12 miles. So jeez, <laughs> you got to You got to swim. So I, of course, when I once I finished a swim, that was like a that was a big boost for me. I felt like, whoa, that went OK. So and you were looking forward to the 560 mile bike ride at that point. <laughs> Oh, oh, definitely. Like, I was, that was that was just like, that was purely, that was good. Wow. <laughs> and then the thing was, it also started raining. So it rained for three days. Uh, <laughs> days. Non, nonstop, yeah. Well, how do you sleep? Like, do you take a time off and go home? Or how does that work? Nah, you got some, you just got some pads. You got like a small tent where you could lie down just on a pad. But I think I slept about five, five and a half hours in four days. I finished about <laughs> five hours. Staying awake like that. People have done much a lot worse, you know. But it's about mind games, really. Keeping yourself awake, experience, and mind games. Knowing yourself and knowing, you know, because when you're on a bike in the middle of the night, you don't want to fall asleep because <laughs> if you fall off the bike, it's gonna hurt. So you have to know yourself. You have to know exactly how long can I go until I'm at the point where I'll fall asleep on a bike. And it, you got to keep your brain awake somehow. I mean, I usually. I don't know. I can't barely remember what I do, but I play all these games in my head and, and you know, count things and you know, try to keep my brain awake. What I was going to ask is, what are those specific games? Have you learned anything that people can carry over into? Perhaps they're not running or doing a quintuple Ironman, but when they run into blocks in their daily life and in some fashion. Yeah, uh, I mean, I have a few things that I do during these races. I mean, there's these small games that I play. Another thing is, and I'm sure most of the people that go very really long distance do, is you, you really section everything into small pieces. Like, if, if you're really struggling, I'm just going to look at, you know, I see that tree over there. I'm going to run over there. <laughs> and then you pick another tree or like a, a, a small, you know, like a hill or something. I'm just going to go there. And you, you know, keep doing that. You don't really think about the long distance. If, if you're struggling, you can just take small chunks of it and just do that at a time. And just keep repeating that. Another thing, actually, that I feel like I tend, I tend to like laugh a lot and smile when I do my races. I'm having fun, basically. And I think that's something that's important. Like, I see it as a privilege to be able to go do these things. And so I see all the great people around me and like the beautiful places I go do it. I just smile because I'm like, you know, look around you. It's, it's a beautiful place. We're having fun. We're privileged. We're able to do this. So there's no reason not to smile. When you're running, are you able to listen to music or audiobooks or podcasts or those types of things? Or is that banned from some of these races? Like, what do you do if you don't have those types of things? And, you know, you find yourself smiling and laughing. Are you telling yourself stories, jokes? What's going on? Well, some of the races, like triathlon stuff, doesn't always uh, allow you to keep, have music in. Uh, I actually never use music. I never have headphones on. Okay. For some reason, it... it I get into this zone, this really, I get really focused at what I'm doing into this zone. It's almost like meditation. And if I listen to music, it kind of destroys that. So, because I'm just listening to the music. So I, I discovered that I do better if I don't have music and if I'm just completely focusing on, on what I'm doing in the moment. I, I guess that's really close to what you do when you meditate. 
how you just focusing on one simple thing. You know, that makes sense. It actually, I mean, having never done that, but I can understand how that would add to the, you know, the reason to do such thing is kind of a, a, a moment to clear your mind or a few days to kind of clear your mind. And, and I want to say, I mean, I do a lot of different races. You talked about the Tough Mudder. I was, I did the world's toughest mudder, and that was in November. The quintuple was in October. I did the world's toughest mudder in November. That's about that's 24 hours when you just do laps on a Tough Mudder. As many laps as you can do for 24 hours. Wait, uh, wait, you do as many laps as possible for 24 hours. How many? How many did you end up doing? Uh, well, they do like this time. They did. That's the first time I tried it out. They do it. I think three years. It's a. This time they did like a five mile. Tough Mudder. It's in New Jersey. Uh huh. And I did. Uh, so I did 19 laps. So I went 95 <laughs> miles. Oh my god! In 24 hours. Yeah, you're pretty much in a wetsuit because it's really cold. You know, it's in November. So. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's how the Tough Mudder was that I did. It was in September, October, so it was freezing. But do they have all of the obstacles and all those types of things at the normal Tough Mudders? Yep. It's oh all my there. God. Everest, you know, when you run up the thing to cash, you have to do that like 19, 20 times. And the walls. That's craziness. <laughs> I did it once and was like, I'm so glad that I was able to do that in my life. I'm never doing it again. And the fact that you did it 19 times in a row for yeah. 24 hours. Wow. And a guy, uh, Ryan, I was third. And I, then another guy, Jun Jong, was second. And Ryan was first. Uh, he went 100 miles. But I... I mean, you know, how do you train for that? Well, you can be fit and really good at doing these kind of obstacle races too, but in the end, it's going to be mental because, you know, if you've done a Tough Mudder, you know, you get a little bit bruised up and, you know, because you hit all these different obstacles with your body. So yeah, at some point, it's just going to be mental. You know, it's just going to be keep going. Let's talk about the physical aspect of it. The recuperation period and your body is obviously used to it i mean if you do a quintuple in october the next month the world's deadliest i don't even i can't even keep track but <laughs> what have you learned about uh, how have you changed your nutrition your rest i mean do you sleep 10 hours do you take ice baths do you eat only fruit what have you learned oh i would not survive at all <laughs> <laughs> I'm fairly common sense, you know, I don't really subscribe to any diets, you know, but it, it's common sense to me in the food that I eat. I'm not a vegetarian in a sense, but I try to like not eat too much meat sometimes and eat more vegetables, but it's it, that's just more common sense, you know, just, just regular good food. I probably, I tend to eat a lot of food and I could eat like four or five times a day. So I, I don't really subscribe to, I actually don't eat take any kinds of supplements at all. I, I stopped that about 10 years ago. Was, yeah. For me, I know, you know, as, a, as I sort of a scientist in medical science too, like I don't feel like there's any supplements that's really scientifically proven to work and, and I don't see why I would put money into it. So, and I, feel, I feel like I'm doing pretty good without taking anything. So I'm trying to get inside your brain because as modest as you want to be, these are things that so few people do. What is your training regimen? Do you run every day? Do you incorporate these things into your daily life? I, I, I tend to do, like, running is what I do the most, but I do a lot of biking, too, and I try to incorporate swimming, too. I try to do a lot of different things. Once again, what I feel is the most important, and we're talking about, because you can't grasp doing these things, is, is, you know, putting limits on yourself. I feel that people put limits on themselves when they don't need to. You know, they just imagine that they can't do things when they should imagine doing them. So... That's the first step. The training, of course, is hard being able to do a lot of training for people when you have, you know, everyday life and family and, and, and work. But there's ways to get around that. There's ways to, to train and for ultras, even though we don't have so much time. The training aspect is obviously very important. How do you find the time to train while, I mean, you have a full-time job. How do you find all this time during the day to, to train and then do other things through your life? Oh, I'm a bit spoiled with that. I'm an uh, academic scientist, of course, so mm -hmm. I, I do a fair amount of work here. But the, the good thing about this, I plan my own time a lot. So I can really plan it out perfectly when I'm training and working and stuff. Also, I have a two-minute commute <laughs> from where I live to where I work. So I guess I save an hour or two compared to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a bit spoiled with that. And it works out really well for me with being able to do all these training. Do you find yourself, you know, running around or biking around the city 
more often than not. I mean, especially living in Manhattan, it's obviously a very accessible city that way. But do you find yourself doing the more physical transportation as opposed to like hopping on the subway and that type of thing? I, I try to. I really try to take any ad- opportunity I can to move instead of taking the transportation. And it's obviously, you know, if you want to run a lot, or bike a lot long distance, you, you're going to end up doing the same routes <laughs> a lot in New York. You know, there's not, I don't know how many times I ran around Manhattan. That's a good run. Uh, just you can run along the water most most of the way around Manhattan. It's about thirty one miles, I think. It's uh, that's a really nice run because you see a lot. So you try to find some variations, but it's it's not an optimal place to live if you if you want to train a lot of these things. But it it works out. It works out. What got you interested in doing this? When did this all start? Was there a demon you were trying to conquer within yourself, or was it just something you were interested in? No, it's actually just uh. It was probably just a sense of adventure. And um, that's why I like people who think, you know, how could you do four or five triathlons? And the longest one is a half Ironman and then off to do a quintuple. Like how, for me, it's a sense of adventure. I like that. I like the fact that I'm not sure how it's going to work out or if I'm going to finish. That motivates me. So what, what I got into when I was like, you know, maybe 16, 17, up, I think I was 16, I started reading these books about mountaineering, about like the first pioneers, the the French alpinists climbing the big mountains in the 50s. It just blew my mind. I thought it was it was exactly what I wanted to do. So, in my teens and around there, I started going into mountaineering. So for five ten years, I was you know around the world climbing mountains as like much as I could during the summers when I was not studying, and and you know uh, climbing rock and ice and whatever I could find. That was my adventure. <laughs> uh, it turned out it was pretty good training for for these kind of races too, because you know it's just long days. It's basically you're basically doing ultras and you know learning how to make yourself keep going. No, I can definitely see that. And I also wanted to talk about, as we discussed prior to the interview, you are a PhD and you're doing your postdoc now. Is that correct? Your research? Yeah. That's correct. That's correct. Could you tell me a little bit about what made you go into this field, what it is that you do? I mean, it's very interesting, something that I know I'm interested in because I've read your bio, but as well for the listeners out there. Yeah. So I could also say I'm I'm originally from Sweden and I moved to the U.S. to, to do science. And I came here to work on a hormone called leptin. Now, it's a hormone that controls feeding behavior and metabolism. So it's involved in obesity research is basically what we do here. It's produced by fat cells, and uh, when fat grows, it produces more of the hormone, and it goes to your brain, and it reduces feeding, uh, like it reduces hunger feelings, and also affects metabolism and so on. So it's like a feedback between your fat and your brain. So you have more fat, more of the hormone, you feel less hungry, and if you have very little fat, it produces very little of the hormone, and your brain becomes hungry. So from an evolutionary standpoint, it's a really important hormone because, you know, Especially like if we if we get very thin and our energy status is low, we need to be hungry so we go out and find food and, you know, don't starve to death. I was just going to say, is that the main hormone that causes hunger then? I mean, is that the one that tells us even after you eat, okay, you've had enough or are those two different systems? Well, th- there are several other hormones that affect this too. This right. So there's a short-term effect and a long-term effect. Yes, there is a short-term effect that you said, like after you eat, you feel uh, full. Uh, but leptin has a very um, long-term effect to your long-term energy status, the feedback between your from your fat to your brain. So in a long term, if you're losing fat, you're going to be generally more hungry. And, and it, what, of course, we know is that, well, people, you could ask yourself, yeah, but if someone who is massively obese have a lot of fat, they produce a lot of the hormone, why are they still hungry? Right. Well, it turns out people become massively obese they have a lot of fat that produce a lot of the hormone, but their brain stops responding. They become resistant. And we actually don't really understand how that works yet. But So it turns out we can't just give people the hormone and expect them to lose weight. So That's what I was, That was literally going to be my next question is, you know, so from your research, what is the, and I know it's probably just a hypothesis at this point, but uh, what do you imagine is going to be the next step in this fight against obesity when it comes to the, the science and leptin? Is there any, anything in the, on the horizon that looks promising? 
my boss, Jeffrey Friedman, discovered this hormone in 94, and we have done a lot of research on this here in the lab, but there's still a lot left, left to discover. And one key thing that I'd say is like, we can discover things about this hormone. I think we're going to do that, and we're going to be able to exploit that to come up with drugs and so on. But as far as we've seen in obesity here now, it's still energy in and energy out. That could be uh, you know, affected by a lot of things but it seems like it's still energy in and energy out, you know? Calories aren't going to magically disappear somewhere in between. So so there's going to be no magic weight loss pill. You'll still have to do exercise, but there will be pills to kind of help. Yeah, I, I don't ever always, you know, there's never really a smoking gun. Right. <laughs> magic pill. Because I always get these questions about this, and I'm, I feel like, I mean, I pers on a personal level with what I do on the side, and, you know, it's, it's, just, it's still about getting yourself moving. Right. The best probiotic, the best drug you can do to help people get better is to move. I mean, it, it does so many good things for you. Have you dove into altering genetics, you know, through the human genome or have you tested that? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we don't do this with humans, of course. <laughs> it's, it's not allowed. I work, yeah. I work, with, I work with mice and uh, it's actually, there's several very new interesting tools that we can do to do mutations and change the, the genome of, of mice and other organisms that is much more powerful and faster than ever before so that has actually just started so i think that is going to be that's going to be a huge thing the next few years that will help us to discover more about how genes work and how they influence physiology and that's sort of what we work on on an everyday basis the last statement you made uh, in the previous question about kind of energy in, energy out reminded me of a conversation I had recently where we were debating whether calories are equal. So I'm wondering your take on it. If I were to eat 2,000 calories of, I don't know, spinach and 2,000 calories of candy bars, would that affect my weight given everything else being the same? Well, first of all, I would like to see what 2,000 calories <laughs> spin and say good luck. Uh, that's going to be an ultra-endurance event. Like, uh, <laughs> but as far as calories, it's still calories. I mean, some people talk about like empty calories. I mean, it, the question is what you get with the calories. I mean, if you absorb these calories, you're gonna still going to have to spend them no matter what they came from. I mean, it's still energy mm -hmm. in and energy out. There's, of course, a lot of other effects. Because what you said is just like, yes, but if let's not say 2,000, let's say, say 500. Eat 500 calories of like spinach or 500 calories of candy, you're probably going to feel more full from the spinach than you are from the candy, I guess from myself. But you might end up eating sooner uh, if you had the candy than if you had the spinach. But then you're also getting these, all, the, all the other nutrients that you get from the spinach that you don't get from candy. But it's still calories. If calories is just the amount of energy that you have in it. And that's just, that's the same. You're still going to have to spend it, but you might eat less. Now, this question has nothing to do with your PhD nor your competitions. I haven't been to Sweden, but I envision it as this magical place, just full, <laughs> chock full of beautiful women. Uh, Why would you leave? <laughs> well, actually, is, I, is that true? I think I like, uh, I get a lot of, you know, Frozen. <laughs> The new yes. Disney movie. That's Norway, yeah. but it's pretty much the same. But and there's a snowman in there that's Olaf. So <laughs> I've had a lot of comments lately. It's it's pretty much like that. Well, I love Sweden. It's it's a great place. But I just felt for me, especially as a scientist, I got amazing opportunities coming to the U.S. Being able to come to New York was a great great experience. And all the races that I do here now, the the ultras and the the obstacle racing and so on are um, something I discovered when I came here. And we don't really have that much of those kind of races. It's, 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 way, it's much bigger here. And something exploded the last few years. I've sure. sort of been a, been a part of that. And I really love it. So I will always love Sweden, <laughs> <laughs> especially now during the Winter Olympics when I'm looking at the hockey. I'm rooting for Sweden. But I really uh, I love the U.S. And it's a great, I mean, it's, U.S. is a big country. It's almost like you know, several different countries together. So being able to also travel through the U.S. and seeing all these great people doing the races and, and all these beautiful places uh, is it's great. I really love that. The last question I had for you was, have you read any books recently or come across anything recently that's really grabbed your attention, whether it be 
just I'm just trying to think somebody that has, you know, this really interesting background such as yourself with the races and the work you do in the lab. Anything that you say, hey, listeners out there, you should check this out. You should read this. You should go to this site. Oh, uh, there's I have a lot of things, but uh... well, drop them on us. That's what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> I love the early stuff. That's what I grew up and got inspired by. And there's so many great things now, too. And there's so many people doing great things, too. People want to read about some true adventure in, a, in the sense that you cannot believe that they went and did these things, you know, without having proper maps. It's those early, uh, early books by the, you know, the first people climbing in the Alps or pioneering and climbing. That's really what inspired me. There's, there's a great book called Conquistadors of the Useless by Lionel Ture, which is one of the, I think I read the book like 10 times. It's great. And Mountains of My Life by Walter Bonatti. These are the people that pioneered climbing in the Alps. But it's not just about climbing. It's about, it's about a sense of adventure. So I definitely would tell people to go back and read those old books because it, it will inspire you to like want to go and do things. That, and that's, that's exactly what I was hoping for. Those two books now are moving up to the top of my list because, you know, I'm, I'm unaware of them, but I love the idea of finding adventure, pushing through mental blocks and uh, pushing yourself, I don't know so much physically, but mentally for sure. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, a book like that could inspire me to just like go out and run 10K. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be going out doing an ultra. It's just, it's just very inspiring. Right. Well, talking to you has been inspiring. I, I, you know, congratulations on the win, first of all, at the Quintuple Ironman. That's really something incredible. I will be keeping an eye out for other things you do. Do you have a sense of fame now? Or you, do you have a blog now? Like you're kind of, it doesn't seem like you're out there too much. Is there anywhere where people can kind of keep up with what you're doing? A lot of the races that I do are sort of obstacle racing and, 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 and the ultras and the ultra races and stuff. It's still kind of an underground sport. Sure. <laughs> so, I do. So, so I don't have a blog or a website, at least at this point. But there's a number of like websites and, and magazines involved in obstacle racing that is coming up that I'm popping out and into. Uh, I mean, I've got a Twitter. It's just my name, at Olaf Dahlner. I'll try to start using that a little bit more. Thank you so much for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Really inspiring. I'm also looking forward to what you can do with Leptin, and hopefully there's some uh, some great things that'll be coming from that. Yeah, and thank you guys. You have an uh, amazing podcast. I'm going to be following you guys now, and I, I, I'd love to hear what else, what other people you're going to get on your podcast. Oh, well, thanks. I really, really appreciate that. All right, guys. All right, All right Olaf. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Welcome back. Hope you guys enjoyed that interview with Olaf. Make sure you head over to smartpeoplepodcast.com and check out the post for this episode, and you can see the video of the said Tough Mudder that just dropped me over and over and over. <laughs> you won't see John falling, but you will see what it normally does. Pretty good stuff. Yeah, what it does to guys that are 6'3", <laughs> 225 pounds, and jacked. It's crazy. And it just makes you appreciate even more. I loved when Olaf said, you know, the hardest part about biking 500 miles isn't the bike ride. It's being able to figure out when you're going to fall asleep so you don't fall asleep going 20 miles an hour on a bike. Well, how about the fact Through that the he, night. he participated in the toughest mutter and, oh, I don't know, just ran 19 <laughs> tough mutters in 24 hours? Come on. I don't know. Let us know what you thought about this interview. We, we thought it was great, and we'd love to hear if you felt the same. As John mentioned, smartpeoplepodcast.com. Great to hear from you guys. Enjoy the show. Make sure to sign up for the newsletter. We'll catch you next week.